All right. Um, welcome to your final screencast of the first semester for our midterm review number four. You really have no excuse to get a zero on this tomorrow, and it's going to be graded as a quiz because I am taking the time to do this for you. So anyways, I don't know how many times I could say or how many different ways, but when you square something, it's multiplied by itself. So x plus 5 squared is x plus 5 times another x plus 5. And the only way you can accurately multiply those is by double distributing. x times x gives us x squared. x times 5 gives us 5x. And now we have to work with the 5 in the first binomial. 5 times x equals 5x. 5, 5 times 5 equals 25. <clears throat> and now we're going to simplify it by adding our like terms in the middle x squared plus 10x plus 25. That is the only correct answer, choice one. The common mistake is choice two and forgetting to double distribute. Please do not choose choice two. All right, number two, Jenna ma manipulated the equation for x plus 7 equals 10 by adding negative 7 on both sides. It would look like this if we were to do it. And what allows us to do it? We need to know these properties. It is two, the addition property of equality. Here. Number Here. three, Jody's older brother is only three years less than twice Jody's age. If the sum of their ages is 30, then which of the following is the age of Jody's brother? Well, there's two unknown ages here, Jody and her brother. Who do we know the least about? We're describing Jody's brother's age, so we don't know anything about Jody. So she is the one who gets the plain variable all by itself, x. And then we're going to use x to describe Jody's brother's age, which is three years less than twice Jody. Well, three years less means it's something minus three. And what are we taking three away from? Twice Jody's age, which is 2x. What's important here is they're saying that the sum of their ages is 30. So sum means we add, so that's going to be x plus 2x minus 3 equals 30. So we're going to solve, combine our like terms, 3x minus 3 equals 30. You're going to add 3 to both sides to get 3x equals 33. And we're going to divide by 3 to get x equals 11. Now that's not our answer. And the tricky part is that it's there. So it looks like it's the right answer. And if you're in a rush, you're going to see 11 and just choose choice two. But that's not it. We're not asking for Jody's age. We're asking for the age of Jody's brother. So you need to take that 11 and substitute it into the expression for Jody's brother's age. 2 times 11 minus 3, which is 22 minus 3, which gives us 19 for Jody's brother's age. Choice 3. I'm just going to make that a little smaller so that I can have room to do our next problem, which is an inequality. And I already started it out for us. I noticed that my students' favorite way to solve a problem that contains a denominator or a fraction is to just get rid of that fraction by multiplying each term by the common denominator. Since there's only one fraction here, we're just going to multiply by the denominator of 3. You want to make sure you multiply each term by 3, though. So this negative 2x over 3 is a term, 7 is its own term, and 15 is its own term. So when we do that, 3 divided by 3 gives us 1. So that leaves me with, I'm going to just bring it over here, negative 2x plus 21 is less than 45. And then we're just going to continue to solve. Subtract your 21 on both sides. Negative 2x is less than 24. And we divide by negative 2. And you've got to be really, really careful. Remember, something important happens when you divide a negative when you're working with inequalities. And it's that we flip the symbol. So it becomes x is greater than 24 divided by negative 2 or negative 12. So choice 1 is your answer. Number five, which of the following intervals is equivalent to the statement negative three is less than x is less than or equal to nine? You've just got to memorize your interval notation. When it's less than and there is no equal sign, it's a parenthesis. When it's less than or equal to, it could be equal to that number, so we have to use something different to represent that, so we use a bracket. 
Remember I talked about one way to remember it is you can make an equal sign out of a bracket and that contains an equal sign. So there you go. Hopefully that helps. And that is choice number one. All right, number six, which of the following compound inequalities is not true? Be really careful with the wording here. So we're looking for the one that's false, that is not true. And statements, in order to be true, both statements need to be true. Or statements, in order to be true, only one statement <laughs> needs to be true. So for number one, five is greater than three. Yes. Ten is less than or equal to ten. Yes. They're both true, so that's true. So it is not choice one. Number two, negative six is less than negative one. True. Six is greater than one. True. They're both true, so that is true. Moving on to or statements where only one needs to be true to be true. Number three, negative five, is that less than two? You bet. Six is greater than ten? No. But it's an or statement, so only one needs to be true to be true. So it's not that one. Remember, we're looking for the false statement. All right, so for number four, hopefully it's it. Is negative four greater than two? No. Is three less than one? No. So both are false, which means it's false, and that is our answer. Moving on to the next page. Given the graph of h of x shown below, over which of the following intervals is h increasing? Remember, increasing is when we are going up from left to right. So here we are, highlighted in blue, we're going up. Think about climbing a hill as we go from left to right. What x value starts the process of going up? When x is negative 3, that's where we are right here at negative 3, and, ooh, not there. We stop increasing here when x is positive 1. So negative 3 to 1. Now, at these two points, negative 3 and 1, we're not actually increasing or decreasing. You're not going anywhere. You're staying still. You're only increasing from after negative 3 up until you hit that positive 1. So that's why when we write it, we use only less than signs and not less than or equals to signs. So our answer is choice 2. For number 8, it says, if a line is drawn parallel to the y-axis through the point 4, 2, then its equation, equation would be... Now, when we're describing it, I think it's good to make a sketch, as I've said. So here's my sketch with an x-y-axis, and I put the point 4, 2 on there. So here's our y-axis. What kind of line is parallel to the y-axis? Well, the y-axis is a vertical line. So all vertical lines are parallel to all vertical lines. So it's got to be another vertical line. And you have to have memorized that vertical lines are x equals lines. And how do we name the line? We name it by grabbing the x value. So the answer is choice 4. x equals 4. Almost done. Number nine. This is what we've been doing this whole unit. Slope intercept form. A line with a slope of five passes through the point three eight. Which of the following is the value of its y intercept? Well, if we look at the equation y equals mx plus b, we know three out of those four things. We know the slope. That's five. We know an x value, three. We know a y value, eight. If I substitute those pieces in, we'll be able to find our missing b value. 8 goes in for y, 5 goes in for m, 3 goes in for x. We leave b there, and we just finish solving. 5 times 3 is 15. And when you subtract 15 on both sides, as I'm doing right here, 8 minus 15 gives me negative 7. So our y-intercept, or our b value, is negative seven. <clears throat> and number 10, our free response question. People are entering a stadium at a steady rate of 32 people per minute. When the gates open, there are already 46 people in the stadium. No one leaves the stadium for the first hour after the gates have opened. All right, I, hi I highlighted a few things here. When you see the word per, we want you to think rate. When you think rate, I want you to think rate of change. When you think rate of change, I want you to think slope. So 32 
people per minute is the rate of change. It's the rate of people entering the stadium. When you see there are already people, 46 people in the stadium, that's your starting point. That's how, how many people are there at the zero minute. And that's going to be your B value. B value is always your starting point. So that's going to help us figure some things out. All right, part A says, how many people will be in the stadium 30 minutes after it opens? Show the calculations that lead you to your answer. Well, we can kind of just work this out without coming up with an equation right away. We know there are already 46 people in the stadium. And so as people are walking in, we're going to be adding that number to 46. We know that 32 people walk in each minute. And if we're looking for the first 30 minutes, that's going to be 32 times 30. So we just have to do some simple math here. 46 plus 32 times 30 is, let's see here, I hope I'm doing my math right. 46 plus 960 gives me 1,006. That sounds right. So after the first 36, 30 minutes, there are 1,006 people in the stadium. Well, let's take what we just did and translate that into a linear equation. Now, we got to be careful. This is really important for the regions. When they tell you to use a specific value, variable, you could have a correct equation, but if you don't use the variable they're telling you, you won't get credit for that. So we need to make sure we're using the variables they're talking about here. B says, write a linear equation for the number of people as a function of the time in minutes. And they want you to use N for number of people and M for the time in minutes. I want you to think to yourself, time in minutes is your input. That's going to determine the number of people. So that's our x value. And then the number of people is our output. So that's really your y value. So if we're looking at a linear function and we want to set it up in y equals mx plus b form, we know that y is n. We know that m is our rate of change, which was 32 people per minute x is m, the number of minutes, and b is our starting point, which is 46 people. So there is our equation, which is basically what we did in part a without an equation. And part c, after one hour, no additional people enter, but some start to leave. If it takes them a total of four hours to leave the stadium, what is the average rate at which they leave in people per hour? So the calculations that lead to your answer. Well, first of all, we need to use the equation we just wrote to find out how many people are in the stadium after one hour. So I need to substitute something in for m, time. So n equals 32 times. Now they told us an hour, but our equation is involved with minutes. So we have to convert one hour to minutes. And so one hour is 60 minutes, and that's the number we're going to use. And I worked this out beforehand, so I'd be ready with my answer. When you do that simple math, 32 times 60 plus 46, you get 1,966. So that's how many people are there after one hour. Now they start to leave. So 1,966 people are leaving. And it takes all of those people four hours to leave. So what we have to do now is just divide 1,966 by 4 and we get 4 goes into 16 4 times, 3, 9, 4 goes into 6. Oh dear, I'm going to have to bust out a calculator to do this math. All right, now I'm back. I did that math and it's 491.5 people per hour. Make sure you always include units, too. All right, so that's it. See you tomorrow. I hope everybody hands it in. Have a good night.